So what is astrology? How long have we been here? What is the nature of the universe and how does Vedic astrology interpret that? I'll cover all these things in this video. Hey, it's Sam and welcome to this first video. What is astrology? What is the history of astrology? By the end of this video, you will know what is astrology in the cosmic sense. You'll also know how astrology works, literally how spirit takes form. You'll know why astrology works, and you're going to know how it forms you and your karma, and how you are an expression of your karma from the Vedic Rishis themselves. And then you'll also know how it creates the world literally through form and spirit in the form of Lord Vishnu and the planets as Lord Vishnu. And you'll also understand how this cosmic wisdom later became what we now call the Vedic sciences through all of the different Vedic sciences. And it actually comes from a body of wisdom that we refer to correctly as Sanatana Dharma, which means the eternal truth. So we're going to dive deeply into all of those things and now realize that this is part of um, some extensive training that I'm going to be giving in anticipation of my certification course. So you want to stay tuned for that in the next few weeks um, because it's already pretty full with a lot of people that registered early, but I want to give you a great comprehensive overview of astrology and in the next week and a half to two weeks, I'm going to unfold the eight spokes of the astrology wheel. So if you pay attention over the next couple of weeks, whether you study with me or not, you will see your astrology practice deepen very much so, and also just your understanding of who you are in the cosmos will also deepen because one is not separate from the other. Okay, so let's get to it. This diagram behind me shows the length of time that our solar system has been here. You see it says four and a half billion years. That's a long time. Before I break this down though, I want you to understand something and not sort of overlook it. You're standing in the midst of enormous cosmic um, order. You know, the Earth that you're standing on right now is spinning on its axis at about a thousand miles per hour at the equator, and it's going around the Sun at about 70,000 miles per hour right now. Pretty remarkable. Well, it didn't happen overnight. It took four and a half billion years for this to happen. And of course, once on its axis is what we call one day. Your entire organism is timed to that day. Your entire organism is timed to each of the planets and all of these celestial movements. So one thing to understand is that during this four and a half billion years, for about four billion years, there was pretty much nothing. There was some single-celled organisms and things like that, but then it wasn't until 500 million years ago we had what's called the Cambrian explosion. All of a sudden, after about four billion years, life just exploded. Then, about 100,000 years ago, modern-looking humans, somewhat modern-looking humans, appeared. If you were to scale that, that's actually one forty-five thousandth of the time. That's what 100,000 is from four and a half billion years. To make that time seem real, if you were to stack 100 450 page books, okay, 100 450 page books, that 100,000 years would be the last page in the book. That's how long human beings have been here relative to this timeline. So it's taken that long for the genius of our bodies and our mind and the solar system to create life and to create this stability. You want to really think about that because this cosmic genius is actually folded into every cell of your body. This is why your body is so wise. You can just eat food. All you need to do is put food in your mouth and your body has all the wisdom to know exactly what to do with it. This is the genius that is referred to in Ayurveda. Ayurveda is the is the Vedic science that really breaks down the genius of the physical body and how to use it as a vehicle toward liberation. Yoga then takes that and shows you how to unfold consciousness through different spiritual practices. But astrology is the science that allows you to understand this cosmic, or I should say the cosmic implications of this genius universe that we inhabit, and in particularly how all of these different beings formed our karma and how our tendencies and our karma and our mind basically um, has been formed 
within this matrix. So the reason I talk about this first is because once we start looking at the Vedic text, you'll see that they're talking about the universe itself, like as Lord Vishnu and as God. I want you to get out of the idea that the rock, that the you know that the planets or the solar system are these rocks moving around, and that somehow we have some kind of relationship with them somehow. How does Saturn up there have anything to do with me down here? Like I said in the first video, one of the biggest things that need to shift is your your idea of what astrology even is. People that take my certification course, we talk a lot about this, especially at the beginning of the course. You need to shift and evolve your understanding, not just of what astrology is, but what the, what the planets are, what your astral body is, your chakras, and all of that, and how the astrology of the, you know, how the astrology chart is not something up there, it's something in here, it's in you. And this whole cosmic divine order is even shown literally by the amazing matrix that we're living in. If you were to take this whole timeline as well and break it down as a journey between Los Angeles and New York City, then this one forty-five thousandth would be like the last block between Los Angeles and like the Empire State Building. This one one forty-five thousandth would be like the last block. That's how long this and and that's a hundred thousand years, which that's a hundred thousand years ago. What about right now, right? If you were to cut that in half, the last fifty thousand years would be the last half of the page. And then if you were to make it the last 10,000 years, which encompasses everything that we know, all recorded history, that would be one-tenth of the last page. That's 10,000 years ago. So it took this long for cosmic genius to unfold and create people that have sophisticated consciousness and intelligence. And when we start looking in the Vedic texts, especially Brett Parashrahora Sastra, you see the way they speak about the universe as, as incarnation of Lord Vishnu and all of that. This is why they speak about it that way, because we're living in this cosmic order where the Earth is going 70,000 miles an hour around the sun, spinning 1,000 miles on its axis. Our whole organism is timed to these cosmic cycles. So let's take a look at the words of Parashara from the great text, Brihat Parashara Horasastra. Okay, so I'm going to be reading from the PDF that you should have downloaded. At the top it says, what is astrology history? And I'm going to um, start with the section on Lord Vishnu. Um, nine, 9 through 12 says, Sri Vishnu, who is Lord of all matters, who has undefiled spirit, who is endowed with the three gunas, although he transcends the grip of the gunas, who is author of this universe, who is glorious, who is a cause and who is endowed with valor, has no beginning. He authored the universe and administers it with a quarter of his power. The other three quarters of him, filled with nectar, are notable to the philosophers of maturity. He goes on to say other things. I'm going to focus on just a few of these because we have quite a bit of material to cover. But then he comes down and he, and he talks about Mahatattva, Ahamkar, and Amkar Murti, which are different facets of consciousness. But then in verse 18, 19, this is from the first chapter of Bharat Parashar Horasastra, he says, Ahamkar is of three classes, in effect, with sattvic, rajasic, and tamasic dispositions. Divine class, sensory organs, and the five primordial compounds, space, air, fire, water, and earth, are respectively from the said three Ahamkaras. So what he's doing is he's also showing the first tenets of what's called Sankhya philosophy, the same philosophy that's used in Ayurveda, where once spirit takes form and breaks out from what's called um, Mahad, which is divine intelligence, then it breaks off into Ahamkara, which is, which is the separate um, self or the, or the potential for separate entities or separate beings. Then it goes into the Tamasic Guna, which has the five elements. Then the second part breaks off into what's called Sattva Guna, and it has the what are called organs of wisdom and organs of action. So this is showing right from the very beginning in Vedic astrology. It's totally in sync with Ayurveda, yoga, and the philosophy, what's called Sankhya philosophy. So then we're going to scroll down to where it says Great Incarnations. We're going over these sections in your download, which should be in red. 
And it says in chapter 2, it says, verses 3 and 4, the unborn Lord has many incarnations. He's incarnated as the nine planets to bestow on the living beings the results due to their karmas. He is John Ardun. He has assumed the auspicious form of Grahas to destroy the demons, the evil forces, and sustain the divine beings. Then it says, now, actually, let me just back up here for a second. It says, of course, it shows you right there the form of Lord Vishnu. He's incarnated as the nine planets. This is his form. To bestow on the living beings the fruits of their karmas. Then, or it says the results due to their karmas. He is Janardhan, which is the facet of Lord Vishnu, which is to destroy the illusion of birth. You know, birth is called Janma. To destroy the illusion of birth, he's incarnated as Janardhan. He's assumed the auspicious form of Grahas to destroy the demons and sustain the divine beings. And, of course, bestow on the living beings the fruits of their karma. Very clear what the nine planets are. They're the incarnations of Lord Vishnu that are here to bestow on the living beings the results due to their karmas and the auspicious Grahas to destroy the demons and sustain the divine beings or to sustain Dharma and truth. So when you start talking about how this one's bad, that one's bad, this one's bad, you're missing the point. They are all incarnations of Lord Vishnu, different facets of consciousness that are meant, they not only meant, they are evolutionary principles and the beings of light, the beings of intelligence and wisdom, the wisdom of your karma, the wisdom of truth and dharma. So then when we scroll down to sections 8 through 13, chapter 2, the beings with more jivatmans are mortal beings. Okay, The high degree of paramatmans from the grahas, surya, etc., did incarnate as Ram, Krishna, etc. So he, just to explain, he breaks out earl, um, earlier in the chapter, you have the sutras there, but he starts saying what's paramatman and what's jivaatman portions. So he puts the grahas, the planets, Surya, Chandra, etc., in the same class as Shiva, Brahma, etc. So they're full-on gods, just like Shiva and the rest. So then he says, after completing the mission, the Paramatmans of the respective Grahas again merge in the respective Grahas. So he's talking about Ram as an incarnation of the sun, then after Ram's life, he merges back in the sun. Krishna as an incarnation of the moon, he merges then back into the moon. So there are Vishnu avatars for all of the planets. But then he says, the Jiva Atma portions from the Grahas take births as human beings and live their lives according to their karmas and again merge in the Grahas. At the time of great destruction, the Grahas as well merge in Lord Vishnu. So they've taken form as Vishnu. At the time of the great destruction, they again merge in Lord Vishnu. The one who knows all of these will become versed in the knowledge of the past, present, and future. Without a knowledge of Jyotish, these cannot be known. Hence, everyone should have a knowledge of Jyotish, particularly the Brahmin. The one who, devoid of knowledge of Jyotish, blames this Vedic science, will go to the hell called Raurava and be reborn blind. It's pretty charged language. Basically, he's saying you will live a life that is blind if you blame the Vedic science, or if you don't know anything about it. Particularly worse, it seems to be, if you blame it. So those of you who just sort of dabble in it, and then sort of blame all your problems on it, you're like walking around blind. Okay? Everyone... The one who knows all of these will become versed in the knowledge of the past, present, and future. Everyone should have a knowledge of Jyotish, particularly the Brahman. That's why my life's mission is to teach it to everyone at whatever level they want to learn. And when it says particularly the Brahman, he's talking about educated people. Okay, I understand there's a, still a caste in India called the Brahmins, but it's antiquated. It's not what they were talking about here. When he says particularly the Brahman, he means particularly the educated people. That's who the Brahmins were back then. You have to modernize this. Okay? You can say, well, I'm Indian, but I wasn't born into a Brahmin family. That doesn't matter. He's, everyone is now educated. And that's what he's talking about. Because sophisticated people, the Brahmins learned these sciences back then. That's what they learned. So again, you can see very clearly the Jiva Atma portions 
from the Grahas take births as human beings, live their lives according to their karmas, and again merge in Lord Vishnu, I'm sorry, and again merge in the Grahas. So after you, after your karmas in this lifetime, in this mortal coil, are finished, your energy merges back into the Grahas. Okay? Then, at the time of destruction, the Grahas themselves merge in Lord Vishnu. So you merge into the Grahas. You come from the Grahas. You, literally, you, this body was formed by your karma, which emanates from the Grahas. They're not something separate. They actually are what give birth to you. It's the womb of the universe. Just think about it. What else is there but the universe? Where else could you come from? What's wrong with coming from that? we got to invent these crazy religions. What's wrong with the idea that the universe itself is where everything is created? It's this ancient beauty, four and a half billion years old, that is so much older than we are, that our appearance a hundred thousand years ago is like the last page in, a, in eight feet of books. How hard is it to believe that this universe is wise and that these planets are not just rocks moving around and our karma is not just some arbitrary system of like carrots and sticks trying to beat us into submission or some other crazy idea. Again, in my certification course, we flesh this out a lot. A lot of questions about karma. People have a lot of confusion about karma because they think it's one thing, kind of what comes around goes around. It's much deeper than that. It's much deeper than that. You have, it's not just that you have karma with the planets. You are a product of your karma with the planets. That's what you are, what you are, what you're calling you, which is this separate being walking around with this ego and these tendencies and these inner conflicts. All of that comes from the grahas, comes from the planets, based on your karma. And you're here to evolve that. So you can relax into the cosmic wisdom rather than struggle against the good ones and the bad ones. So this is the foundation. This is, bef this is the first two chapters in Brihat Prashahora Sastra. Before he even gets into how to do astrology, this is what he talks about first. And literally what you are is, again, the Jivatma portions from the Grahas take births as human beings, live their lives according to their karmas, and again merge in the Grahas. Right? So this is also should make you understand that, you know, there's this kind of new age convention to say, well, my soul chose to come here, I chose to come here. It's okay to look at it that way, but the truth is, you come here when the Grahas bring you here again. That's what the birth time is, is the moment that your karma lines up with the message in the sky, this is, this is your incarnation. And if you didn't remember choosing it, then you didn't choose it, it was chosen. Okay, so this is a great introduction for the rest of this first um, class on history and the origin of astrology. The first thing we need to know is this stuff first. We need to know this before we start then unraveling things like the sacred texts and what all those texts mean. So we'll do that now. Okay, so let's go over this cool mind map on how to do Vedic astrology correctly, and we're at the first spoke in the eight spokes of the astrology wheel, and that's the history. And you see here we have this overview of the text, Vedas, Upanishads, the Puranas, the mythic stories, which led to the Vedic sciences. So this is a general incremental order of how the Vedic text and the Vedic lineage unfolds. And I try to group these things in a way that makes sense um, there is some crossover for sure because the Indian literature is very, um, you know, complex and dense. And sometimes some of the Puranas and the mythic stories refer back to things that are in the Upanishads and all of that. But this is a general sort of classification of the way these things unfold. So first we have the Vedas. There are four Vedas. These are the ancient, the most ancient texts. First was the Rig Veda, which was the oldest. And it's basically hymns to um, the sky gods, really, and that... As far as astrology goes, this is where all of the deities and lords and rulers of the nakshatras lie. So when you do nakshatras, you're actually tapping directly into the pure Vedic wisdom that's literally in the Vedas. Because you can say Vedic astrology, but a lot of it is stuff that's also in Western astrology, just with some Indian references. But when you're talking about pure Vedic, this is literally from the Vedas. And that includes 
um, you know, deities like Indra and Agni and Soma and Ahibunya and the eight Vasus and, the, you know, the Petris and all of these, these were all in the Rig Veda primarily. The Rig Veda was the incantations and the, and the mantras that they would say to bring the, you know, to bring the deities down into form. Um, you also had the Yajur Veda, which was the second Veda. There's a Krishna Yajur Veda, was where you have a lot of the earliest astrology proper. Um, Yajur Veda is also where you have things like the Sri Rudram, which first showed the appearance of Lord Shiva. But in particularly as in particular as it relates to astrology, Yajur Veda was very important because it had the first sort of um, codification of what's called the Vedanga Jyotisha. Some of that also appeared in the Rig Veda, but it was the most um, um, organized in the Krishna Yajur Veda, and you understand that the first application of Vedic astrology was to, again, have them know when to call spirits down, when to call the actual deities down into form, um, and it was all about the timing of rituals and when the priests should do things, especially in the Yajur Veda, there's a lot of instructions about when they should say the mantras, what the different nakshatras mean, what the qualities of the nakshatras are, the panchangam, the five-fold division of time that we use, that, that priests now use so that when we perform a puja, we know how to tell the deity to come into our time and place. Understand this, it's really cool because you'll notice when they do ceremonies, if you've ever gone to an Indian puja, what the pujari will do is he'll, he'll basically say the place where you're sitting, like let's say it's in California. That's the, that's the space, but then he has to tell the deities the time. Now, he's not saying, you know, Tuesday, January 3rd. He's using cosmic time, which is, you know, it's Uttarayana, the northern course. It's this nakshatra. It's this paksha, which means it's, you know, the waxing or the waning moon. It's this nakshatra. It's this titi. It's this nitya yoga. These times never repeat. It only happens once. And all those instructions come from the Vedas primarily, at least initially. This is where you started seeing that codification of Vedic astrology as the science of sacred and divine time. Because if we want the deity to come out of the sky and inhabit the statue that we're doing a puja to, like if it's a Ganesha puja, you want to bring, you want to tell Ganesha where you are in time. You're here in space, but time, cosmic time, is all of the stuff that we see in the Panchanga. So all of the stuff in the ancient Vedas show our place in cosmic time. Cosmic time is not Thursday, January 3rd, 2012. That's nothing to do with cosmic time. That's a Gregorian calendar time, which has nothing to do with cosmic time. Cosmic time is Uttarayana, Krishna Paksha, Magha Nakshatra, you know, fourth Titi, you know, Shiva Nitya Yoga, that's the cosmic time that brings the deity in to the statue. So here we are, come into the statue, now we're going to do puja. So that's the earliest use of, of astrology. And this is how we, we can learn a lot about astrology by studying sacred timing um, and not just, you know, not just the ancient Vedic sacred timing, but the timing every day. This is why one of the main things I tell my students is pay attention to the sky every day. That's how you can really learn. So then we have the Samaveda and the Atarva Veda, the last two. Samaveda had a lot of um, music. They put a lot of the hymns from the earlier Vedas to music, a lot of creativity in that one. And then the Atarva Veda had a lot of things that were much more cultural. And you saw the first major um, moves toward Ayurveda and healing in the Atarva Veda. Some say it's not as much of a Veda as it is another, you know, type of book, but it's still considered one of the Vedas, one of the Chatur Vedas. Then you had the Vedas led to what are called the Upanishads. This is where a lot of our Sanatana Dharma and the Sankhya philosophy that we know comes from. A lot of the important mantras um, come from Upanishads like Loka, Samasta, Sukhino, Bhavantu, um, um, you know, Brahma Pranam, Brahma Hadir, Brahma Nau, Brahma Nahotam, Brahma Yabatena, Gantavyam, Brahma Kamar Samadhi, you know, which is something we say before we eat food. Many of these kinds of, you know, Asatoma, Sad Gamaya, Tamasoma, Jyotir Gamaya, Amritur, Ma Amritam Gamaya comes from different Upanishads. 
There's about 15 major Upanishads, um, and they're, they distill the essence of the Vedas into a philosophy. So it's the source of Vedanta. Vedanta is the philosophy of all of that Vedic stuff. Again, the early Vedas were mainly techniques. There wasn't a big philosophy behind it. They already knew the philosophy. The philosophy was, this is who we really are. We're these divine beings living here on earth. Here's how we bring it in. Here's how we use it. And all of the hymns were ways to actually bring the energy down or, like, awaken it. But then as we started to get, stu you know, get more stupid, as we got closer to the Kali Yuga and in the darker Yugas, they started to develop these philosophies. So a lot of the Vedanta um, comes from the Upanishads, and it's a source of many examples that you've heard of. Like, for instance, there's the example of the pot of water in the sun, or that we're like many pots of water in the sun. There's still only one sun, and you can see the same sun reflected in every pot of water, but that doesn't mean there are a million suns. There's one sun. Just like there's one consciousness, there's one Paramatman, there's one Supreme Self, and we are all versions of that. Under the illusion that we're just this being in this pot. Under the illusion that we're the sun in a pot. We're not the sun in a pot, we're the sun. And our illusion around the sun actually revolves around this idea that we're just this limited reflection of the sun in the pot of water, when in fact we're the Paramatma. So this is an example. This comes from one of the Upanishads. I don't remember which one. You could be a, a you know scholar of the Upanishads. There's so many. And some of the most important ones are the Isa Upanishad, the Pradharanyuka Upanishad. This is where the essence of Vedic wisdom, what's called Vedanta, and all of the Vedic thought and all of the wonderful examples come from. It's also where you start to see a lot of the other principles of Sankhya philosophy codified, especially some of the Upanishads. This is where you start seeing the koshas that we talk about in yoga, the different bodies that are part of our astral system, and the chakras and all that. You start seeing this in the Upanishads as well. So then you have different kinds of literature. Um, the Puranas, which are um, lives and stories, um, they're books that are about the life and the stories of deities. Um, there's like the Vishnu Purana, the Skanda Purana, the Shiva Purana, and these are where you see the deities, not the Rig Veda deities, because the Rig Veda deities are sky gods, and they're, re they're related to celestial um, nakshatras, but like for instance, Shiva and Ganesha and Parvati and the modern Hindu deities are sort of codified from those ancient Vedic deities and you see this group of Puranas, what as they're called, talk about the life and story of different deities. So of course the Vishnu Purana is all about the life of Lord Vishnu and his many incarnations. Skanda Purana, Skanda was the son of Lord, of Lord Shiva. There's the Shiva Purana which of course is about Shiva. So Again, there's a lot of stories and kind of hijinks that the gods go through. You, there's a lot of stories about Lord Shiva and Parvati's courtship. One of the things to understand about all of this, all of it, is there's an astrological component to all of it. Shiva and Parvati, Vishnu and Lakshmi, Brahma and Saraswati are different ways to personify the masculine and the feminine, the sun and the moon, for example. So you see the interplay between Shiva and Parvati um, in many texts. In the Skanda Purana, there's a lot of that. And it's an interplay between the sun and the moon, all the destruction and the creation, and Shiva doing penance, or I'm sorry, Parvati doing penance to the sun, or to uh, Shiva, and all of these kinds of things. And it, once you really dive into it, you understand it's all astrological. Um, so, again, all of this stuff is really drawn out a lot in the certification course. The whole first module is where we talk about nothing except these things. We're talking all about the, the qualities of history and the, and the different texts and then how those things became sciences. Another important group of texts are the mythic stories. Now these, this has to do with the lives of incarnations, not lives of deities, but lives of, of divine incarnations. Particularly, there are the Ramayana, uh, the Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita is part of that. Ramayana is the life of Lord Rama, who's said to have actually lived on the earth, which is different than the deities who are, you know, 
incidental beings that live in the sky or you know that live in the subtle realms. The Ramayana is about someone who has supposedly lived on Earth. At least that's the myth. And frankly, it doesn't matter whether it was true or not. Sometimes people say, do you really believe Lord Krishna actually lived? Do you really believe Jesus lived? Do you really believe Lord Rama lived? Who knows? Nobody really knows. And that's not the point, actually. But it's said that Lord Rama lived, and his story by the, by the great poet Valmiki is, is portrayed in the Ramayana. Mahabharata, which literally means the great India, um, is more about the life of Lord Krishna and the great war that happened on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. An extrapolation from Mahabharata is the very famous Bhagavad Gita, which means the Song of God. And so this is a different group of texts, the mythic stories, that um, are supposedly there to show us how to live our life on earth. This is the difference. Whereas the deities, you know, the, um, you know, the Puranas show the life and stories of deities. We don't, you know, since we're not deities, we can't, you know, make the earth, you know, you know, plunge the earth into the bottom of the milk ocean and then go down to the bottom of, you know, all of these heroic things. When you get into... When you get into the Ramayana, Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita, we're talking about ways to illustrate our life on earth as lived through the life of these mythic, I'm sorry, of, the, of uh, these incarnations of people who apparently lived. And there's a lot of supernatural stuff in there as well. But the scenarios are things that we face. War, treachery, deceit, a lot of psychological um, implications, very, very deep stuff should read the Bhagavad Gita if you never have. It doesn't even take that long, incredible story that distills the essence of yoga, the essence of devotion, what's called bhakti, or and also discipline practice, which is raja yoga, and also jnana yoga, which is the yoga of intelligence and wisdom. It's beautiful. So those mythic stories show us how to, or, you know, those epics show us how to live our life on earth. And then this whole body of knowledge and wisdom, which I said at the beginning, is generally referred to as Sanatana Dharma. This universal wisdom is pervasive throughout all of it. All of it is, is just a way to further um, illustrate and personify and, il and show this universal truth, this eternal truth, Sanatana Dharma. So all of those stories and all of those texts refer back to that same thing. And then they filter down into three major sciences. There are others, of course. There's also Vastu, which is sacred architecture. Hastasamudrika, which is palmistry. There's even things like archery, and there's all kinds of sciences. But three of the main ones are Ayurveda, which is the science of things like diet and environment and taking care of our physical body. Yoga which is the science of evolving consciousness through disciplined practices. Oh, and, and in Ayurveda, the, major, uh, the first main text was called the Charaka Samhita. In yoga, the, the first texts, you know, the main texts were Bhagavad Gita and the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which is much more methodical. And then Jyotish, or Vedic Astrology, and the main text is Brihat Parashrahor Sastra, which is what we were reading from earlier. So those Vedic sciences became ways to then connect with this Sanatana Dharma in real time. Jyotish, as I said at the beginning, Vedic astrology is the science of time and how our karma is literally unfolding, why we have the tendencies to do what we do, why we have a tendency to derange our Ayurvedic constitution. Based on our chart, we can see why we have a tendency to have this pitta. Well, this person's got, you know... Mars in Leo in the third house. That's me, by the way. Or, you know, what kind of yoga they wind up doing, you know, because, you know, so you can see the tendencies in astrology and the timing of things. That's what it's for. As I say, you can go back to even things that don't have to do with natal astrology. Like I said at the very beginning, the earliest uses of astrology were to bring spirit into form and to know exactly when to do the rituals and exactly where to tell the deities to find us in time. We tell them where to find us in space, we need to t tell them how to find us in time as well. And th that's why I'm saying the earliest uses of astrology had nothing to do with natal astrology, had nothing to do with reading birth charts. That came much later, actually was mixed with Greek astrology or, you know, with, with um, 
you know, other forms of astrology, Babylonian and other things. Um, and then it became codified into the astrological systems that we use now. So this is an overview of the first spoke in the astrology wheel. We need to understand the history, not just of India or of this, but of the solar system. We need to understand how these principles and these philosophies form what we're going to do later. And again, this is in some ways the most important stuff because what you think it is has everything to do with how you're even looking at it, what you're expecting it to deliver and whatnot. As I said in the first video, this is probably in many ways the most important spoke of the wheel because your whole idea about what you even think astrology is, is the entry point to everything else that you can learn or not learn. And so leave me some comments. Let me know what you think of this. This is incredibly important. And again, in my certification course, there's an entire module, like uh, four weeks, six, um, six weeks, if you include the conference calls, dedicated to making sure we get this right and we dial it in. Um, and in the next video, we're going to be talking about the frameworks, how all of these, this, this structure and this history um, and these qualities of Sanatana Dharma lead to the sacred frameworks. One and, and you know, two of them we already talked about from Brihad Prashahura Sastra, the three gunas and the five elements. But then there's also the four poor shartas, which are Dharma, Arta, Kama, Moksha. Then there's also the caste warrior, worker, merchant, teacher. Also the truth of karma, the results of our actions. These are all very important structures from Sanatana Dharma that we need to honor. These frameworks, again, they frame everything else that we do in astrology. So make sure to get that next video.